Welcome back, everybody, to the Disclosure Team channel. Um, anybody has any questions during the interview, please pop them in capital letters as I have a better chance of seeing them, and then I can pin them and ask them at a relevant point. Thank you so much to everybody that's here in the live chat. I really do appreciate you being here for this. Um, if you could just please keep the chat nice and cordial. I'm all for differences of opinions and a good you know, bit of banter, but you know, just keep it nice. That would be uh, highly appreciated. So yeah, without further ado, I'd like to introduce my guest tonight. So uh, this is somebody I've uh, wanted to speak to for some time. We recently connected uh, privately, and yeah, I'm really excited for this conversation. So I hope you guys enjoy it too. So Frank Milburn is a former UK defense intelligence officer and army paratrooper with over 23 years of experience producing threat and risk assessments for clients operating in hostile environments. His experience includes providing strategic and operational assessments of prevailing business environments for extractive industries, as well as a variety of Fortune 500, aerospace and government clients. Frank is an alumnus of the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst and the London School of Economics. He has written peer-reviewed papers for a number of globally ranked think tanks, including the Middle East Economic Survey, the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point, and the Institute for National Security Studies at Tel Aviv University. He is an affiliated researcher with the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies and is a member of the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies. So please welcome Frank Milburn. Frank, how are you? Thank you very much, brother, and it's a real honor to be on. Thank you. That's my pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Um, I'm going to do something which I don't normally do at the start of a show, and I'm going to jump straight to uh, a couple of questions that have come in. And this Go one isn't it. even this one isn't even UFO related, but I just thought I'd jump in with it. So it says, Frank is a military man. Please ask him why, when a clearly insane leader is single handedly holding the whole world to ransom, this monster has not been assassinated. OK, so I, I assume that we're, um, we're we're referring to Putin here, right? To Vladimir Putin. I would have thought so. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'd say I don't consider him. I don't consider him perf um, personally to be insane. Uh, certainly a megalomaniac and certainly has, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, has a has a violent uh, dislike of anybody who is not Russian. Um, but I think uh, it's a question of, you know, he was a former colonel in the KGB. So if you rise to power uh, as a former colonel in the KGB, you're going to have people around you who will protect you um, because, uh, you know, it's the kind of job that you do, right? So uh, he's pretty switched on that way. I think he's not very switched on at all in the way that he invaded Ukraine because uh, that's a whole other question. But uh, he completely uh, overestimated the abilities of, uh, of the Russian military and completely underestimated, um, you know, the will of the Ukrainians to resist. And also of uh, the Western military powers, you know, in the EU and NATO, uh, you know, to support uh, the Ukrainians. Yeah. Are you surprised at all that there haven't been any assassination assassination attempts at all? Well, there have been assassination attempts. Um, if you look at, uh, you know, opponents of Putin, there have been plenty of assassination attempts. Uh, but, um, you know, he is a former KGB lieutenant colonel. So... Um, you know, he's going to have people around him. He's going to be very aware of his own security. You know, I mean, if you're yeah. like me, I, I, I'm a, you know, I used to work with, um, you know, State Department and with uh, US DOD and Special Forces in Iraq, right? And you know, I'm a, I'm a trained, uh, well, counterintelligence professional, and also a close protection professional. So, um, it would be kind of like the same for me if I were looking to somebody to protect myself and my family. I'm a professional, so I would know the kind of people that I want to surround myself with to protect myself. Yeah, that makes sense. No, I appreciate that. So let's start now where I probably would normally start. So I'd like to know when you first got interested in the whole UFO subject in general. Uh, when I was a very young child, um, I was brought up with uh, UAP phenomena. Uh, my mother my grandmother and my grandfather are what you would call uh, experiencers or in those days they used to call uh, psychics or mediums um i had uh, i'm an experiencer i had visions as a you know as a teenager um when i told my grandmother about this uh, she told me it's no surprise whatsoever uh, my my house in london where i used to live was always full of uh, mediums coming from israel the united states 
uh, people like uh, you know Finn, uh, Phyllis Schlemmer, like uh, you know famous uh, you know a famous uh, um, you know Israeli medium. Uh, that was kind of like my upbringing, um, and uh, as far as UAP goes, I was always open-minded to it. Um, I was sent to when I was at university when I was twenty. Uh, I'd already uh, I'd already uh, been a paratrooper. Uh, I had a while I was at university. I was sent by my, my by my grandmother and my mother uh, to study under a medium uh, called Inez uh, Nicholson and also a, another medium called uh, Owen Potts. And uh, I did past life regressions with them. And uh, that was nothing to do with UAP, but that, uh, that definitely put me in touch with me, kind of like, you know, what, what you call that, like the psychic side. And yeah. then when I was in the military, shortly after that, uh, there was no doubt in my mind that uh, UAP exist, that UAP were uh, penetrating uh, the UK air defense region. And since that time, I left the military uh, kind of like late late 90s i read books uh, like uh, you know timothy good um um you know nick pope okay and then i got uh more interested in kind of like 2016 i got uh, in touch with uh, richard dolan and then i got on his website and from there it kind of like all snowballed and then i started gathering information and then you know, by what was it 2020 in November, I'd already written my first paper because I decided like, um, you know, why am I why am I being on the sidelines? Um, I'm obviously interested in this and I obviously have like some kind of um, um, I have some kind of uh, I have something to contribute, uh, which comes from an intelligence background. And that's why I got involved. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate that. That kind of leads me into this question from Ryan Sprague. He says, did Frank ever come across UAP related issues or the topic in general during his intelligence career or his contracting work after? Uh, yes, I did. In my, in, in my military intelligence career, um, I came in contact with pilots who had um, uh, performed interceptions with UAP. Are you able to ex expand on that at all? Uh, yes, uh, there was Sorry. a there was a kinetic effort to shoot down the UAP because they were over sensitive areas in the UK air defence region, um, and uh, the RAF weren't able to shoot them down. They tried with um, uh, anti they, they tried with homing missiles, right? With uh, with, with uh, you know radar homing missiles. They tried with uh, infrared seeking missiles and then they closed uh, to uh, within three kilometers. And they tried, you know, with, uh, you know, the internal cannon the aircraft have and they were not able to shoot down the UAP. But the UAP were considered a threat. Do you think that the, the, the reason why they weren't able to shoot them down, was it weapons malfunctioned caused by the UAP? Or was it something to do with the materials and the sh like, almost the field around the UAP? Uh, from uh, the information I got from the pilots, I believe that it was um, there was some kind of uh, field around the UAP uh, that basically um, it uh, you know the the radar homing missiles had uh, no lock on effect. Initially, they had a lock on effect, but when they left the aircraft, they had no lock on effect. Uh, then the the infrared missiles they left the aircraft, and then they had no lock on effect. And then when they closed to within three uh, less than three kilometers. Uh, the uh, you know the, the cannons that the aircraft had had no effect, uh, so I can only put that down to uh, you know uh, superior advanced technology that the UAP had as an intelligence yeah. officer. And have, has this specific case is it is it noted anywhere in the National Archives files that have come out, or is this uh, one? No, not at all. And do you know if it was investigated by DI fifty five? I know it was investigated by me. Oh right, okay. That's intriguing. That's very intriguing. I mean, it it, it almost reminds me of a case that I, I wanted to talk to you about, which we might as well jump into as well, which is the, the 1976 Tehran incident, um, a case that I'm definitely fascinated with. I know I saw, obviously, Ryan Sprague's question there for us, and I know Ryan has written recently about the case, a fantastic article. So if you don't mind, Frank, would you be able to just give us a quick overview of the case and what it involved? Because I believe it involved two specific incidents within that one. 
Yeah, sure. It was uh, 1976. Uh, it was um, basically north of um, of Tehran, which is the capital of Tehran. Uh, people understand understand that um, you know, in that time um, we're talking about the uh, Imperial Iranian Air Force, and that Iran was a, a major ally of the United States and NATO. Okay, and it was a major major recipient of uh, you know the, the latest uh, American technology, uh, and there were two interceptors which were launched uh, in relation to this UAP. Uh, both of them were F-4 Phantoms. Uh, they were the latest F-4 Phantoms that the Americans had, which they'd given to the Iranians, and they had the latest uh, Sidewinder missiles. Uh, the, the, first, um, the first encounter, uh, the pilot took off. He saw the object, um, but he returned to base because basically um, his, uh, his communications were shut down and his navigation sh uh, systems were shut down. Uh, the second pilot uh, took off with his backseater, and it was absolutely terrifying for them. Uh, they confronted the object. Um, the pilot uh, uh, saw uh, a bright orb detach from the major object and fly towards them. He thought that it was um, a, an air-to-air -air missile, um, and he went to his own weapons, and he tried to select a missile to fire, and his weapons panel went off, and also his... Uh, his intercom went off, so he had to scream at his backseater, and also his UHF communications back to base went off. So then he turned uh, very sharply away uh, from this object that was streaking towards him because he thought it was a missile, and uh, then he returned to base. And then uh, when he was on the ground, um, he was subjected to uh, major tests, and the Shah of Iran actually approached him and said, uh, what do you think um, is the, you know, who is the intelligence or what is the technology behind, uh, you know, uh, you know, this kind of craft. And uh, Jafari, who is a pilot, he said, well, I think it's something from beyond this world, because if anybody on this earth had that kind of technology, uh, then, uh, you know, they would rule, they would rule the earth. Yeah, it's an absolutely and, fascinating case. And uh, yeah, I was just going to just going to add as well. Also, there was a, there was an American team uh, because there was an American uh, uh, team that was training the, the Iranians. And there was a colonel on the ground, and he actually said to Jafari, he goes, oh, actually, it's very good that you didn't fire upon them, because it could have been a lot worse. And then that same colonel uh, sent, a, uh, uh, sent a signal uh, by a defense intelligence agency, which reached uh, all of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and also um, uh, the, uh, uh, the White House. And uh, then there was a follow-up by um, uh, another, an Air Force intelligence officer, who said this is the best example of, uh, of a UAP. Wow, that's amazing. And you mentioned there the Shah of Iran, and we know that he ha has had an interest in UFOs and actually came out uh, as an experience to himself, which I believe is, I mean, you, you posted something on Twitter the other day, and that's the first I'd heard of that. So can you tell us a, a little bit about that? Yeah, well, sure. I was, um, I was, looking, for, um, I was looking for Biden's uh, 60 Minutes talk, on, uh, and I wanted to hear about him talking about um, you know, Ukraine and, uh, and, um, and Taiwan. And so I watched that and then it had like a, then on, on YouTube, it showed me like, a, you know, old uh, 60 minutes talks. And one of them was about uh, the 1973, uh, uh, you know, um, um, oil crisis. So I clicked on that and the Shah of Iran came up talking 1973. And then he's talking about being an experiencer. And the actual, the, the interviewer actually says to him, oh, uh, but, you know, um, you know, you're the Shah of Iran, but you've had like experiences. And then, the, and then the Shah of Iran starts talking about, you know, he had dreams and then he started having visions about his future. And then that made me think, well, actually, this is actually really incredible. And that's why he actually had a lifelong interest in, in UAP. That's incredible. That's absolutely amazing. Do you think, I mean, there seems to be a lot of obviously cases involving aircraft and mil military aircraft in, in particular going back decades. Do you ever see any kind of pattern in any of those cases at all? In terms of what? Well, I mean, like there's weapons shutdowns or the inability to, to fire upon these things. Do they always see them as a, as a threat? And is it generally, are they seen over sensitive airspace? Well, I'd say um, the SCU, the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies, um, for those who didn't go to their, uh, their summit in June, um, there's some very incredible work that's being done um, on uh, exactly on uh, uh, UAP and nukes uh, from uh, 1990 uh, from 1945 onwards. 
um, in terms of the interest of UAP. And I've actually correlated it uh, statistically in terms of interest in um, uh, in uh, uh, in nuclear bases, in terms of uh, nuclear missile silos, and also in terms of, um, you know, initially where, you know, the nukes are being produced. And it's very, it's very, very intelligent. There's no doubt in my mind that there's a high interest by, by UAP in every aspect, in every, every level of, uh, you know, the, the, the human nuclear phase from, uh, you know, uh, uh, designing of a, a, a nuclear weapon to production of a nuclear weapon to deployment of a nuclear weapon. And so that includes all sort of uh, warships and anything with sort of nu nuclear capabilities then? A anything with a nuclear reactor, yes. That leads me in. I've got a question here about the nuclear aspects from Dave Mills. With their long-standing interest in nuclear, do you think they would allow a nuclear strike? Uh, well, they did in 1945. Uh, you know, the, the Japanese got wiped out. So um, a lot of people ask me this. And a lot of people say, oh, you know, like they're here to help us. Well, there have been something like, um, I think it's like, uh, well, hundreds of nuclear tests uh, above ground or atmospheric, above ground, underground and under sea since 1945. So if they were here to help us, then, you know, why haven't they done it by now? That's a good point. That's absolutely a good point. Now, obviously, I, just, I mean, I just brought up there like the uh, warships and things nuclear powered, which leads me just to, I just I can't not speak about the Tic Tac with you because it just seems that that area, whether it be military or, or anything in general off of Catalina Island in the channel, as he always seems to have been a hotbed and, you know, nuclear or not, there's, you know, um, magnetic anomalies in there. So do you think what, what is it do you think that attracts these things to that area and have done for so long? Well, I talked to Kevin Day about this, and um, I did um, a presentation that people can look at. It's uh, under APEC, uh, Frank Milburn, Catalina sightings. And I talked to Kevin Day about this, uh, Kevin Day being one of the, the witnesses to, uh, to the Nimitz, and, an, an air t and, a, and, a, and a basically a surface-to-air expert. Uh, there's nothing uh, that that bloke doesn't know about uh, you know, uh, surface-to-air uh, combat, right? And uh, but he also told me, he said uh, that whole area. And I asked him, I said, well, how easy it would be to sneak a submarine in? And he said, uh, he said, uh, the U.S. Navy owns that whole coast, like air, uh, surface and subsurface. So I think there are definitely, uh, you know, anomalies in that area. I mean, the area is so deep. Um, but I also think um, that. Um, it's absolutely real what the U.S. Navy have been uh, have been seeing, and I don't think there's any kind of doubt about that. Yeah. So, I mean, what what are your thoughts then if we move forward to the 2019 sightings? You know, the swarms off of the coast. You know, with multiple Navy warships. You know, and it's been the drone thing has been thrown in there so many times now, and and we've seen these clips from Jeremy Corbell. We've we've seen the recent footage that's come out. I think the war zone might have brought something out so i mean personally i'm quite at a loss with it i don't know which way to look which way to think so i'd love to know what you think of that currently well i'll tell you um i'll tell you Vinny. You know, i wasn't there i didn't see them sure. with my own eyes and i haven't ac had had access access to you know the classified intelligence right so yeah. you know all i can do is speculate of course um sorry i mean what are your thoughts on sort of radar spoofing technologies, holograms and that kind of thing. Do you think that that could be a, a serious contender or possibility for, for these incidents? Uh, no, I don't, because, again, I spoke to Kevin Day. And also, don't forget, uh, you know, when I was in military intelligence, I worked with the Royal Air Force. I used to fly on AWACS. OK, so I was privy to uh, you know, beyond top secret uh, intelligence. And I knew what kind of spoofing technology we had. OK, that was like, you know, the mid 90s. Uh, but um, I know for a fact that, uh, you know, when you're engaging in like, you know, a large NATO exercise or, you know, a national exercise, uh, you do not um, you do not inject uh, something else from from outside that exercise uh, into the exercise, because uh, 
especially when, you know, in the case of the Nimitz in 2004, uh, when they're preparing for war, uh, you do not do that uh, because it would cause uh, it would cause basically. Well, that, that, that's when I spoke to Kevin Day and he said, well, um, the reason why, uh, you know, the officer on the deck listened to me is because he said I said that this was, uh, you know, a, an anti-air threat, that there was a threat of you know, these objects in the air that could cause, you know, a problem from our, for, for our aircraft. And that's precisely why uh, you wouldn't do, you wouldn't use spoofing or you wouldn't use, you know, some kind of, a, uh, you, know, uh, you know, exotic technology. You would not inject that into an exercise. No, absolutely. I mean, these, these cases, specifically the Nimitz, you know, is, is really thrown this subject into, you know, the eyes of the Congress and people like that. And then, you know, last year we got the preliminary assessment, you know, which saw the UAPTF uh, then morph into newer offices with new acronyms and that. So I'd love to know your thoughts on where we stand right now with with the current play, because, you know, we've got this new Arrow office, uh, but we heard even today that um, John Greenwald of the Black Vault put in a FOIA request for more information well, on the last iteration of AOI MSG, and they're just not releasing anything at all. So it's, it almost feels like we're taking a step back again, but I'd love to know what you think. Well, I mean, now it's the um, now it's the unidentified aerospace undersea phenomena uh, task force group, right? I believe. So, you know, it's changed again, and you know, for the best, because that means that uh, you know Congress has taken charge. Um, but I don't think um, that we in the public are going to see uh, you know anything like fantastic, because you know all this is designed basically to bring to the attention of Congress uh, classified. Uh, you know, classified uh, incidents which are happening and which they can never release to the public. But the, I mean, we've heard recently about the Navy is saying that they're not going to release any more videos and then people are saying that it's over classification and if they wanted to, they could sanitize any images and videos to not give away inf you know, data on the sensor systems themselves. Do you agree with that? Well, I spoke, I asked Chris Mellon about this uh, last week. And, um, and I said to him, well, you know, uh, one person told I said, I said, look, Chris, one person told me um, the U.S. Navy don't want to release this information because um, the videos are like so game changing and so indisputably like, you know, alien that it would be like game over for anybody, uh, you know, in, in the kind of background who's trying to like keep the cover on UOP secrecy. And Chris Mellon came back and he said to me, and, and don't forget, he's like an advocate for, you know, for transparency, at least for Congress. And he came back and he said, no, that's not the case at all. He said, I know the person who did the classification. And he said, that's not the reason at all. He goes, it's for national for national security reasons. Wow. OK. Interesting. That's very interesting. And, and I trust him. I mean, you know, the guy's never bullshitted me. I, that's, that's I asked him questions. I asked him questions. Uh, sometimes he just blanks me. He doesn't answer. <laughs> and that means like and, and i just take that well okay that that means is it yes or no i just don't read anything into it but he either answered me in the yes or he answered me in the no and and, and that's what that's what i say and i always ask him you know can i can i quote you or can i not quote you no, that's fair enough appreciate the answer thank you so i guess you know it would be good for people to temper their expectations going forward with relation to any new information coming out from the government side of things for now anyway so Obviously, we've got a lot of other entities, the Galileo Project, UAPX, so many companies, uh, entities coming into this subject. Do you, uh, do you think we'll see much from them? Do you, do you hold much weight in the, in the work they're doing? Uh, yeah, I do very much from the Galileo Project. Uh, but as a, uh, a former British uh, military intelligence officer, uh, I would be looking much more to, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the possibility that uh, the UK... Uh, has affected crash crash retrievals, at least one crash retrieval. The UK. Yeah. Okay, that's new to me. I mean, I've heard things in the past about it, but are you able to tell us any more? I can't give you dates, uh, but um, okay. a bloke that I trust very much, um, and when I left the military. Um, we used to hang out a lot together, and um, uh, he was uh, head of a very, um, a very secretive UK unit. 
okay, that uh, conducted the kind of missions um, that um, you need to have done overseas, but you don't want to have acknowledged overseas, okay? And he told me that um, he had been head of a crash retrieval team uh, that uh, um, uh, secured uh, a site in, uh, in northern UK. And when they arrived at the site, uh, his team, uh, they discovered uh, evidence that there were um, you know, um, you know, biological entities that were occupants of the craft and that they had basically, um, uh, you know, uh, eff effectively done, you know, um, escape and evasion. And then he said to me, then it became a hunt uh, uh, to find those biological entities. Wow. <laughs> okay. That's thrown me completely sideways. And uh, yeah, I appreciate that a lot. That's making me think for a second. Sorry, everyone. I, I, it's making me think. Have I got enough information to go and do some digging or asking some questions? Because I'm just intrigued by that a lot. I was going to ask you questions about the UK. The I'm pushing no, the I, I, I genuinely appreciate it, and that's I. I didn't expect to get that kind uh, that kind of answer from you. So, a little bit uh, mind blown right now. So, so but thank you. Um, you know, I'm not going to divulge um, you know, who, when, or where, or why. No, uh, of because, course. Um, no, it's not just about. Um, I've got to be very careful about, uh, you know, the, you know, I signed the Official Secrets Act, right? So I've got to be very, very careful. But also it's much more about, uh, you know, I'm not going to throw, you know, a mate of mine under the bus. Of course. Okay? Because, uh, you know, uh, when you're in the military, when you're a paratrooper, you know, I work, I was a paratrooper. Uh, I work with SAS. I work with SBS. Okay. Uh, I work with, you know, special forces. And it doesn't matter who you're working with. It's like you don't throw uh, your comrades under the bus. Yeah, absolutely. It's so one thing I've learned in a very short time is that you protect your sources to the, you know, massively. That's something I, I do. And so I, I honestly, I respect that so much. Well, we've so. seen that I did that. I mean, with, uh, for example, with Amy Eskridge, right? I mean, uh, you know, right. loads of people were pinging me where I got, where I was getting my information from. But it wasn't until, uh, you know, her demise that, uh, you know, uh, I revealed that she was one of my sources. Uh, Ross Coulthard, even, he didn't know. He kind of suspected. Um, but uh, it wasn't until she died that he realized that I said to him, yeah, but because, uh, you know, I'm a former intelligence officer, okay? I, I was trained to identify people who, who have access to specific information, and I was right. trained uh, how to, uh, you know, persuade them to give me access to that information, and then how to manage that relationship, right? That's what you do. It's called agent handling. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, and a big part of that is you never, never, ever shaft your source. Well, I mean, it's you know, if you burn one, you, you might as well burn the rest because people aren't going to trust you ever again. That's well, the, the way I look at you. it. Exactly. And, that, and that's why, you know, for example, you know, I was in Northern Ireland. That's, for example, why, you know, the British in Northern Ireland were so successful because uh, they offered, for example, uh, you know, members of the IRA who were dissatisfied. They said, OK, will you grass up other members of the IRA? And, you know, we'll send you to uh, Belgium or Germany and you'll have like a new life and you'll have like money to set yourself up and like a new job. Uh, and, and we won't grasp you up because if you fuck your sources, nobody will come back to you. Exactly. That's it. So now I really do. Uh, I, I appreciate that a lot. Um, and one thing I did want to talk to you about with regards to the UK is that it, after sort of Project Condine, you know, we didn't really hear much from the UK. We had the the National Archives releases over you know three years towards the the sort of two thousand seven eight nine kind of period, but it seems to have gone completely dark. Um, and I've spoken to people who uh, have been previous uh, members of the MOD, etc., who aren't so sure that they've stopped looking into this. They've probably just buried it deeper in some obscure annex. Uh, what what do you think about that? I don't know because. Um... You know, I left the military in 1998, right? So I can't say for sure. But um, you'd be absolutely stupid. And uh, based on my knowledge of, um, of working with the RAF on, uh, you know, high readiness units, you know, flying in AWACS and yeah. seeing, uh, uh, you know, being in an AWACS and seeing, you know, like a, a Russian bear aircraft, you know, approaching the UK air defense identification zone and then seeing, uh, you know, uh, tornadoes, um, you know, being, uh, you know, uh, sent to intercept them. I would say, uh, 
of course, uh, you know, UAP happenings are still, you know, are still going on. And it's interesting, if you look at uh, Project Condine, it says that, uh, you know, UAP would never be considered, would only be considered to be a threat to the UK if they were entering uh, the UK air defense region with impunity uh, in time of crisis or war, uh, if they were entering the UK defense region and uh, ground-based radars and, uh, and, air, uh, and you know, um, you know, fighters in the air were un unable to intercept them. And then thirdly, uh, if uh, UAP were able to enter the UK air defense region and, uh, and to scour Eland, you know, electronic intelligence, signals, signals intelligence, yeah? Yeah. The thing is, wouldn't they be con considered a potential threat even if they just entered into our airspace and we couldn't, A, identify them? You know, uh, that's what doesn't make sense to me. Why does there have to be a specific time? Surely it's all the time. You know, if, if an unidentified aircraft comes into British airspace, surely it's setting off alarm bells left, right and centre. Well, that's the whole thing. It does. I mean, if it's like an airliner. And don't forget, since, um, uh, you know, since, um, you know, 9-11, uh, especially, you've got like, uh, you know, you've got tornadoes. You've got fighter aircraft in every NATO uh, country. Uh, on standby uh, in case there is uh, an airliner which has been taken over, you know, by Islamic crazies and they will shoot, they will shoot it out the sky. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Uh, I'd love to move on to this question here, which I thought was great from Linda Thompson. Uh, hello, Linda. Uh, do you think King Charles now will be more open about UAP? Hi, Linda. And that's a beautiful question. Um, I think that King Charles will be. Um, I think that he has uh, an intrinsic interest in that. And beyond, and beyond that, I think that he'll be a fantastic king because he cares about the environment and he also cares deeply about, uh, you know, disadvantaged people. Excellent. That's really good to hear. I think I agree. I think he'll be a, a really good king. Uh, um, yeah. Well, he's a paratrooper. I was a paratrooper. I swear to loyal. And the thing is that people don't understand, right? Is that like people like me, right? I swore allegiance to the Queen like twice, yeah? And uh, my allegiance, uh, I'm not serving anymore, but my allegiance transfers automatically to uh, the King because it says, I promise, to, uh, I promise to serve Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth and her heirs and successors. So if she dies, automatically in the military, your... Uh, it's transference of your allegiance to uh, the heir and successor, in this case, Prince Charles or King Charles. Wow. Okay. I didn't know that. Fant that's really cool. Fantastic. Well, Prince Charles is airborne and I will serve him unto death. There we go. I appreciate that, man. I appreciate all military people uh, who have served in, in this country and anywhere in the world. I think it's a, to do that. Your duty for your country is, uh, you know, is something to be respected. So. Yeah, but um, mate, I, I just say on that, it's like uh, you're not just doing it for your country. You're doing it for like you know your family. Uh, I mean, for example, my family. Uh, my dad was uh, my dad was was Royal Scots Greys. Then he was Airborne. Then he was SAS. Uh, my stepdad was uh, Royal Scots Greys. Then Paratrooper. Then SAS. Uh, my godfather was Coldstream Guards, and then Paratrooper. And my other godfather was you know Sir Pete the Billier, right? Who um, um, who, who, who commanded uh, British forces in the first Gulf War. So, you know, I come from a, a long line of, uh, of military soldiers. And, you know, it's, it's something that's imbued to you. Uh, that is, you know, loyalty to uh, the, dif the difference between family, regiment, country it, 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 and army it, it is very, very small. Yeah. No, I can imagine definitely. I, I, I mean, I have a, my grandfather was in the navy, but we don't come from a line, like a line or a family of military men. But I, like I said, I do respect it heavily. So yeah, I appreciate that. Um, actually, let's stick with the military theme because one uh, gentleman who I know you're friends with, who I have had the pleasure of interviewing, and would love to talk about is uh, retired Colonel John Alexander. Uh, so I'd love to know how how that sort of relationship came about, how you met John, and. Uh, and anything from there, really? Yeah, um, I met. Um, well, I basically I saw him on the Jack Sarfati email list, 
And then um, I thought, right, I'm going to be cunning. I'm going to be cunning here. <laughs> and then I approached, uh, I approached the colonel and I said, um, oh, do you know, um, uh, uh, do you know the, the head of Delta Force, right? And um, he's like, yes, I do. He said, uh, we, served, we served together in 1958. We were both on the, on the, uh, on the Ranger course. Okay. And, uh, and I said, oh, well, uh, you know, that gentleman, uh, my old man knows him from, from Hereford uh, because uh, um, uh, that gentleman was at Hereford and basically served with SAS for two years uh, before going back to America and then forming Delta Force. So that was my end to Colonel John Alexander. Uh, basically, that we were both airborne and that I don't have a special forces background. I was never badged special forces. I was never badged SAS or SPS. Um, I was badged uh, paratrooper, and then um, I'm in uh, intelligence corps. I was never badged special forces, but I've been around special forces all my life. Yeah, I mean, I enjoyed my conversation with John. Uh, you know, a, a, he gets a lot of stick from people. I think it's hard. To, it's it's hard to kind of see why sometimes I wanted to speak to him. I did. I found him very engaging. Um, I think he's a great bloke. So, you know. Well, I'll tell I, you, I, um, you know, like he knew, he, he knew Charlie Beckwith, right? Who my dad knew, right? Charlie Beckwith, who set up uh, you know, Delta Force, okay? And my dad knew Charles Beckwith. So when I said to wow. Colonel John Alexander, uh, my dad knows, uh, you know, my dad knew Charles Beckwith, right? He now deceased. Then that gave me an in to Colonel John Alexander. And Colonel John Alexander, he said to me, okay, um, you know, you sent me some papers that you wrote for, you know, um, you know, various, your various papers you sent me. He goes, okay, I don't think that those are so stupid. Uh, he goes, I will talk to you, talk to you about UAP. Wow. But he's very no nonsense. He's very no nonsense. Yeah. But um, I have to say um, he's become a mentor to me. He's become a mentor to me. And um, I always call him Colonel. He, he always calls me Frank and he signs off as John. But I always call him Colonel. It's a mark of respect. Yeah, absolutely. It's a military mark of respect. Yeah, no, I'm sure he appreciates it. But um, what, have you had conversations with him about the early days at Skinwalker Ranch, for example? And I just wondered what uh, yeah, your thoughts I were. I mean, you know, he, he's look. You're, you're talking somebody who was, um, and this isn't like uh, you know um, anything uh, you know covert. Uh, he was a member of the Phoenix program in in, 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 in Vietnam, right? Uh, which was basically to assassinate, uh, you know, members of, you know, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese. And as a special of, special forces officer, he was involved in that. So he's a highly trained military officer and also an assassin. OK, as you know, all special forces personnel are, were, were assassins. Um, and when he told me that, um, that he got recruited by... <laughs> That you know, pre nids, and uh, and he said that he went to uh, basic the ranch, and, like pre nids, and he said that he was sitting out there night after night, and I, I was just thinking, like, man, it's like a, you know, only a badass American Army Green Beret would be doing that, because <laughs> yeah. like uh, I'd be shitting myself. I agree. I, I would too. I like to think that if invited, I would say yes and I would go. But you know, I have heard some stories. Vinny, I think I'm a badass, right? <laughs> I think yeah, I'm I'd a badass say. paratrooper, but uh, uh, that would make me shit myself. Yeah, but it kind of it, for me, I yeah, of course you would, but I mean, of course I would, but surely it's like an opportunity to be up close and personal, potentially with the phenomena. Mate, I <laughs> give you my honest truth. I'd rather be, um, I'd rather be shooting out with insurgents in Iraq as I used to do. Uh, after a complicated ambush, then I would like to be on uh, on, on Skinwalker Ranch. Wow. Okay. That's just my maybe personal you've preference. Heard, maybe you've heard some things that maybe I haven't. Then let's maybe maybe that's the thing. Uh, no, it's just um, I can't control the paranormal. But uh, you know, if somebody's trying to shoot at me and killing and and kill me, then I can control that and I can control them. But if it's something paranormal, then I can't control them. So you know, as a former professional military officer. Um, I am more comfortable with being in war against humans uh, than I would be on some remote ranch uh, dealing with 
you know, some disembodied entity that I have no control over. And that, you know, even if I had, uh, you know, weapons on me, I, I, I couldn't kill. Basically. No, that makes sense. Yeah, I appreciate that. I do. I do. I mean, just sticking with Skinwalker Ranch, I mean, obviously, there's, it gets a lot of n negative uh, fingers pointed at it, especially Brandon and his team on Twitter, you know, people saying that they're doing it just for TV and all these purposes. Personally, I, you know, I've spoken to some of the guys on the ranch. Uh, I believe there's something genuine going on. Um, so I'd just like to know what your views are. I mean, if you've had any conversations about any specific aspects of it, because it seems like it's multiple phenomena that could be working there. So, yeah, I'd love to know what you think about that. All I can say is um, John Alexander is a mentor to me, and he's talked to me about, uh, you know, Skinwalker Ranch from the earliest days. And... Um, you know, I've been on uh, on various um, you know email threads, including with uh, you know Dr. Travis Trailer, Taylor. Right? Uh, there is no doubt in my mind that there is uh, you know some you know highly crazy anomalous activity going on at Skinwalker Ranch. Okay, and uh, you know for me, as you know, if I put my head on as if I put my hat on as a former counterintelligence investigator, uh, there's. There's so much that meets the eye that I cannot explain. And therefore, uh, for me, it's anomalous. And I I have to believe in the anomalous. Right. Does that make sense? You, it does, yeah. Yeah, it does. I, I mean, you mentioned it there a few times, and this is something that I, I guess I wanted to, to ask, but I didn't know the right time, so I'm just going to ask it. Is counterintelligence gets... Again, something is there's something that people see or hear of that, and they go, "Oh, it's negative. They can't be trusted." It's it, you know their job was counter intel for goodness' sake. So, how how could how do how should people understand the the true meaning of counter intel and why it, it isn't a bad thing? You know, it frustrates me when I see well, you can't trust. Uh, and Lou Elizondo gets it the most, you know, uh, as I'm sure you might have seen. But you know, if you could just kind of clear that up for me or and for people, I, I'd really appreciate that. Yeah, sure. I mean, I've had it a lot as well. Like, uh, you know, you're kind of like, a, you know, a deep state agent and, you know, some <laughs> kind of other bullshit. It's like, well, um, sorry, but, you know, while you're sleeping in your bed, um, you know, people like me, uh, we are uh, doing uh, two different kind of jobs. Uh, one, uh, we are investigating, uh, you know, the penetration of, uh, you know, Russian and Chinese and, uh, you know, foreign hostile intelligence, uh, you know, activities. And how they are, they how they are trying to, um, you know, uh, basically penetrate, uh, you know, our security, and how they are trying to, uh, you know, um, basically recruit our people. Okay, that's called security intelligence. And then uh, the other side of counterintelligence is physical security, which is the the physical measures that you take uh, to protect, you know, uh, you know, people, uh, locations, operations, uh, you know, bases. Uh, information, uh, you know, information technology, right? That's the other side of counterintelligence. But there is a there is a dark side of counterintelligence, which is, uh, you know, you do in investigations uh, into, you know, who is, uh, you know, trying to penetrate your networks, right? So, uh, you know, that that's when it gets kind of tasty. But um, it's, uh, you know, nobody that you should not trust, because basically, we are here, and we are protecting you, or trying to protect you from things like, you know, the Novichok, uh, you know, nerve agent attack that Russians perpetrated in 2018 in the UK. OK, yeah. we didn't succeed then. But uh, you have to understand that uh, in America, the UK and, you know, allied forces, uh, you only see a very small percentage of, of of the successes that we have. You will never see the vast majority of the successes that we have because that has to be, you know, highly, uh, you know, highly protected. I guess I'm, yeah. I mean, I understand that people can be dubious sometimes, but it doesn't take much to kind of have a few conversations, do a bit of research, and, and I think it becomes a bit clearer as to the real kind of direction of and the meaning of what people are, are doing, especially if they have counter intel backgrounds. So, yeah, well, I'd I say appreciate. to anybody you know, who, who doubts my loyalty, it's like, well, uh, you know, I, I've been to war, I've been to two different wars, and, you know, I've served my country. So, uh, you know, how am I uh, being a deep dark state state actor? You know, I've been protecting my country from like the word goes since I was 17 years old, since I joined up as a paratrooper. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now I can't 
do this interview without asking you about uh, specifically the two papers you wrote for uh, for Bisa, uh, the Begin Sadat Center. So basically, I'd first like to know how you got involved with them and it, and come to write the papers. I will just bring them up on screen, and they are linked in the description of this video. So we've got the first. Uh, wait, was this the first one that you wrote? That's the first one, yeah. Yeah, and then you went on. So this is the about the Pentagon's UAP task force. And then yeah. you wrote this one, American Development of UAP Technology, a fait accompli. So, yeah, how, how did they come about? You know, I've read, I've, you think, I was aware of these almost before I was aware of you. Um, I've read them multiple times and I've reverted back to them on multiple occasions. I think they're fantastic pieces of work. So, yeah, I'd Thank love to know how brother. that came about. Thank you, brother. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, um, how did they come about? Uh, yeah, I basically, I wanted to write about UAP but I didn't just want to write on a blog or some kind of like, you know, UAP blog. Uh, sure. I was very determined that, um, you know, given my, uh, you know, London School of Economics background and my military intelligence background, I wanted to have, you know, some kind of like, you know, finite um, kind of like, you know, granite wall behind what, what I was writing. And so then I persuaded uh, Beggins to that center to, you know, to let me write these, uh, these, these two papers because my, my key objective was um, to inject UAP, uh, not the woo-woo stuff, but inject uh, UAP and the national security aspects into uh, the mainstream of uh, war studies, national security studies. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what I did. It's amazing. It's fantastic. It's my, such a... My concept was to, was to penetrate uh, the wall of uh, basically ridicule and to force academia uh, by having two papers published by a major uh, university think tank, a globally ranked think tank, so that nobody could ignore what I was saying. When you did just that, that's the thing. It's absolutely, you know, when, when I saw these, I, I, I was blown away. I didn't know anything like that existed at, at the time, uh, you know. So, yeah, my, hat, my hat's off to you completely because, yeah. Like I said, I've reverted back to them in my research many times. Uh, so yeah, well, thank that was you. Because for... that, that I, I I was actually at the time I was thinking about doing a you know a, a master's degree with um, uh, with uh, you know King's College London, right, in national security studies. And then right. I started thinking, right, I got into the UAP stuff, and I was going, but hang on, they're not into UAP stuff. But actually, if you look at um, you know what the Russians want, the Chinese want, and potentially you know, the threat posed by UAP. This is the most important, uh, you know, strategic study su uh, subject that is not being taught in universities. And then I just thought, why the fuck would I do a master's? <laughs> because uh, it basically doesn't, it, it's basically completely, in, in, in Spanish you say, uh, es ciego, it's blind. Wow. That's, a, <laughs> that's amazing answer, I appreciate that. I'm sorry, I've just seen this question here, which I think, because you mentioned there, you know, you, you kind of focus in a bit on the nuts and bolts, as I suppose you could call it in, in that work. But I know that you're open to the sort of the woo and the consciousness as well. So oh, totally, yeah. So this question from Dave Smethers, shout out, Dave. Uh, does Frank think there is credibility to the ultra terrestrial explanation Hal Potoff recently put forward, uh, i.e. terrestrial based and complex paranormal interactions, as well as nuts and bolts stuff? Uh, yeah, big shout out to you, Smethers. Um, thank you very much for that question. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, but uh, as always, I say, you know, I'm not a guru. Uh, I don't know. I mean, not even, uh, you know, uh, you know, Keel or Valeno, right? <laughs> But it's a speculation, and this is the thing. I think sometimes I know in the past I've been really um, nervous to speculate on things, but I think it's not. It's, it's not wrong to speculate as long as you're careful and coordinated and you don't put it across like it's, you know, a, a really solid belief. So, I mean, I, and I do, I think people want to know what, how, how you think. So if you were to speculate, you, it kind of gives a good picture of that. So, yeah, yeah but Vinny, the way I think is, uh, I think like a military intelligence officer. Okay. I mean, even <laughs> yeah. though that was like, you know, years ago, it's like um, it's ingrained. Yeah. Once you've been part of the system, right? you, know, you never escape. Uh, but it teaches you to think in a very, very logical, uh, in a very, very logical way. And, you know, not in a, in a way that, um, you know, um, that negates, uh, you know, kind of like, you know, outbound uh, hypotheses. And I 
think I like to think that I carry that forward. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, I'm a believer. So well, I say a believer. Sorry, sorry. I'm not a believer. I'm an experiencer, right? Sure. Uh, believer is the wrong word. I'm an experiencer. Uh, I believe that there are phenomena that uh, we cannot as yet, um, you know, um, assess through scientific means because we do not have the physics uh, to understand, uh, you know, what is going on. Um, but at the same time, I'm a very, I'm a very logical human being. Right? I'm a former military intelligence officer, so I'm a very logical human being. And I will, I'll, I will always try and find the most prosaic, uh, you know, the most prosaic, uh, you know, reason or conclusion uh, towards what I'm thinking about. So, you know, like we were talking about earlier tonight uh, before the show, uh, we were talking about, you know, Calvin case. And I gave you like, I think, four or five different reasons why I thought that, uh, you know, the Calvin UAP uh, was not, uh, you, know, um, you know, exotic American technology, because I'm always trying to look for the most prosaic reason possible. OK, and, and that makes me happy because I look for the most prosaic reason and then there's some other reason that I can't figure out. Then I'm like, uh, OK, yeah, then then it's something beyond uh, beyond what I understand. I think that's a great rule of thumb as well. I try to do the same. Absolutely. Put everything before, you know, in, in that scale of ticking everything off first before you get to the, the you know, the. And that, sorry, that's why I hate debunkers, because they start with the point of view that, you know, this is all bullshit and, you know, experiences like you're all fucking idiots. Right. Sorry. Excuse my language. No, don't worry. Um, it's cool. Yeah. Um, whereas I'm like in the middle and I'm like, um, OK, if you're going to talk woo woo, then like, you know, show me some proof. OK. Uh, but at the same time, I'm open minded. I'm open minded to the fact that, that, that there are things that I've experienced. Uh, there's things that I know about from my military intelligence background. And there are things that I know from, you know, for example, um, you know, Skinwalker and, uh, you know, uh, Nimitz and, and other cases that are, you know, uh, they're not explainable. They are not, uh, you, you cannot rationalize them in terms of normal physics or in terms of, uh, you know, terrestrial platforms. No, absolutely. And I think that's, you know, I don't, I don't tend to, to mention the debunkers or, or the aspect of things I, I tend to just stay away purely because i don't have time i'm busy um, but uh, you know one thing is i think that they they think that there's a problem that we shouldn't have an open mind or or that we having an open mind automatically me means that you jump to that higher belief and you're just like oh we'll we'll forget about all the possible prosaic explanations and that's simply not the case uh, and, and so i'll yeah. tell you what it is and, mate it's like they're terrified of the reality they're terrified of the reality that, uh, you know, there could be, uh, you know, beings from you know, extraterrestrial beings or ultra terrestrial beings. They are terrified of the reality that, uh, you know, there are, you know, invisible entities that can, uh, you know, exsanguinate cows uh, within sight of, uh, you know, a rancher 400 meters away. Uh, they are terrified of the reality that, uh, you know, these invisible beings may be able to interact, interact amongst us. And, you know, we have no ability to, uh, you know, no control over that. That is what they are afraid of because, uh, you know, they look, I'm afraid when I think about these things. Right. And like, you know, I'm a former army paratrooper. Right. There's not many things that make me afraid. Okay? But, uh, <laughs> well, when I start thinking about, you know, um, you know, the possibility of, uh, for example, in um, in, uh, you know, the close protection team for the American president, are there are there invisible entities who could intervene and, you know, uh, cause a launch of a nuclear missile? How secure is, uh, you know, the United States president? How secure is, uh, you know, the Russian president? That's a good point. You see where I'm going with this? I can, I, absolutely. The valid points. Absolutely. And, you know, I've, I've dived deeply into, uh, into uh, you know, uh, you know, Dr. Jacobs, right? Uh, you right. know, uh, walking amongst us, you know, uh, the threat and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Eric Davis told me um, that he was a great academic, but then he started to kind of like lose it towards the end of his life. But also, right. if you look at like Timothy Good's, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, books, he's talking about, uh, you know, beings uh, in Italy uh, that are benign and that live amongst us. So if you accept that, then maybe you could accept the fact that there are malign beings li living amongst us. And, uh, you know, being a former counterintelligence officer, uh, I am highly suspicious. 
Oh, absolutely. That makes perfect sense. But this is the thing. You get so many angles and points of view of these beings, them beings, and they're here, there, and everywhere. And I mean, it, it does kind of, there's no data to say which is right and which is wrong. So I believe that we have to keep an open mind. I think that's number one. And and yet, you know, we seem to get vilified for that in, you know, on, the, on, on I don't know, it's our side of the community. I don't like talking sides, but it seems that it, it feels like that at the moment, you know, that people are just getting shot down for having a certain way of thinking and that. And, and, and I just, it, it baffles my mind and I, I don't give any time to it. So <laughs> that's all I got to say it's about a very that. Simple way of thinking is like, um, you know, if I can identify something, it is, um, it's either a threat or it's not a threat. You're either on my side or you're not on my side. If you're not on my side, then, uh, you know, prepare to be killed. Okay. Yeah. There you go. I like that. I'll, I'll take that on board. Absolutely. Well, listen, Frank, before we finish off, I'd just like to know what you've got going on now or moving forward and what we're likely to sort of see from you in the future. Uh, well, that's a very good question. Um, I'm engaging in some private research on UAP, uh, which I won't be divulging to the public. Um, and that's what I will be doing going forward. That's fair enough can't argue with that well listen frank thank you so much it's been an absolute honor to speak to you uh it's an open invitation you're welcome back here absolutely anytime one thing i have started doing is a lot more panel discussions so i think you'd be great on a panel discussion with maybe some other intel or former military officers that could be something that would Vinny, would be i'd always be happy to be back on and always happy to talk with anybody you want me to talk to very very happy thank there you brother you uh, that's fantastic if you hang around we'll have a chat uh, after the stream finishes uh, but yeah thank you again uh, and thank you to the chat thank you for the great questions I'm sorry if I didn't get to them all I will give a quick shout out to Jimmy for the five dollars donation thank you so much brother I really do appreciate that uh, and thank it, you it, to all the listeners thank you yeah you guys rocked thank you so much and I'm like I said I think Frank will be back multiple times in the future so for now guys I'm um, Go check out all my social medias where you'll see upcoming interviews and, and other things that I'm up to at the moment. Uh, for now, enjoy your evening. Take care. Goodbye.